Thank you for joining us at Community On Demand. Today's message is presented by Dan Greer. Dan holds a doctorate from Grace School of Theology and is the senior pastor here at Community Church. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service at Community. Let's listen in as Dan begins. So last week, we viewed and talked about five revivalistic periods uh, here in, in America and uh, ending with that last period being the Jesus People Movement. If you remember, we talked about that, the Jesus People Movement of the 60s and the 70s. Now, it's interesting that this last revivalistic period seems to have launched a, us into a decade of peace, prosperity, and economic growth in the 80s. Now, people don't talk about that much. They don't actually connect it to the revival that was just ending there in the 70s. And, and, and that's the way it usually is. You say, I, I, uh, uh, what do you mean, peace, prosperity, and, and, and economic growth during the 80s? It, it was there. We lived through it. Let me give you some examples. Let me show you. In, uh, in, um, in, in 1979, if you remember, those of you that are old like me, Back in 1979, uh, the, there, there was this revolution going over in Iran, and, and that was when uh, uh, these college students, over, uh, militant students, overrun the U.S. Embassy and took 53 of our diplomats into uh, custody or captivity, blinded them, and was holding them hostage for some, I think, 52 of them for 442 days, 444 days, over a year. And then at the conclusion of the presidential inauguration on January the 20th, 1981, they released the, uh, the hostages. They got to come home. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. And a couple of years later, the Soviet Union collapsed. It's as if God Almighty was working behind the scenes and these things were happening that we've not been able to do for many, many, many decades. It, it was a time of peace. The 80s was a time of peace. If you'll go back and check, go Google this to check me out. No wars in the 80s. Not, not only that, we experienced the longest peacetime economic expansion on record. Uh, in 1980, we were in a recession. The GNP, the, the gross national product, was negative 1.73%. By 1989, it had grown to 3.66%. Amazing. Economic growth. Uh, in the 80s, in 1980, do you remember this? Gas prices had soared to a dollar and 19 cents a gallon. And by 1989, they had dropped to 66, 66 cents a gallon. Uh, for, for you that can remember that, you know. Uh, in, uh, uh, in 1980, inflation was a, a staggering 14%. I remember buying a house and had to pay 18% interest on it. Yeah. But by 1989, it had dropped to 3.5%. We call, sometimes we call the 1980s the Reagan era, and rightly so. But I believe that the reason that we experienced so much economic and growth and peace and prosperity is that we were coming out of a revivalistic period of the 60s and 70s and Jesus people movement. God was blessing us because we had turned to him and, and, and sought him, and we were going through a time of revival. During that same time, we began to see something else in the 80s that, um, uh, that, that we, we probably don't talk about. Life was so good that we honestly didn't think we needed help from God anymore. It's almost as if we said, Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. We've got it from here. We, we got it. We, we've got it. We'll take it from here. And we begin on a, uh, instead of seeking after God, we started seeking prosperity. We started seeking power. We started seeking pleasure. 
We started spending all that money that God had given us. And we began to go through a period where that we had just sort of put God to the side. And we started seeking the blessing instead of the blesser. In fact, in the church, during that same period of time, it was called the seeker-sensitive movement, where we sought to go to church to be entertained as opposed to going to church to be equipped for life and ministry. We, we heard phrases like this, and I even used it a time or two, so I'm going to confess to you. We heard phrases like, come in, sit down, and enjoy the service. I felt like saying, come in, sit down, and enjoy the show, you know. I mean, that's we, we just took this turn in Christianity from, from service to showtime. And it was that time in the 80s that it seems like Christianity began a downward trajectory. And it, it seems that we began at that time experiencing a revival relapse that has lasted for decades. Here we sit today, crime, inflation, war, war, moral depravity, uh, human trafficking. And, and, and we're at a place now that we're asking, can we turn this thing around? What can we do? Our country is, is going down very quickly. I don't know about you, but that's a pattern that I go through in my life. When I'm under stress and distress and, and hardships, I, I, I tend to serve more, study more, pray more. I, I tend to seek God. I fall on my knees, and, and, I, and, I, and I pray God. I begin to confess my sins, repent. And I turn to God during those times. And in turn, he's always faithful to revive me, restore me, bless me, and bring me out of that darkness and into a time of revival. And if I'm not careful, what I'll end up doing is I'll say, boy, this feels good. I think I'll take a vacation. I start coasting a little bit. I start drifting a little bit. And before I know it, I'm right back on that broad road that leads into destruction. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever go through that? I think we all have. I, I think if we were to be honest, all of us sitting here today have experienced what I call revival relapse. One moment we're praying, we're worshiping, serving, growing, giving, feeling revived and blessed. Then before we know it, we're pulling back. We're missing services. We find ourselves not praying, not reading our Bible, not attending services, not serving, and what happens at, during that time, we begin to experience something else emotionally. We start feeling empty. We, we start complaining. We, we start condemning. We become angry. We find ourselves indulged in our old sinful habits that we're trying to get something of essence back into our lives. And so we turn to the flesh to do that. And we find ourselves right back in that cycle for that now it's time for us to seek forward for revival again. You know, today I said a moment ago, we're at the end of the book of Nehemiah. And sadly, when we come to chapter 13, I mean, we were revived last week. We come to chapter 13, and it ends on a negative note because the Israelites ended up in a revival relapse, and they experienced that when Nehemiah was suddenly called back to Persia. So I'll turn to Nehemiah 13, and we'll just jump down to verse number 6 and begin right there. In Nehemiah 13, verse 6, it says, I was not, this is Nehemiah's nar narrative, by the way. It says, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I returned to the king. Then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king, and I came back to Jerusalem. When Nehemiah was in charge, Jerusalem went from, ready for the title of the book, went from worst to first. Okay? I mean, these, when he got there, the people were in stress, had been beat down, broken down, burnt out, and, and, and they were at the end of themselves. But now, under his leadership, they have been experiencing revival. They're walking around on the top of the walls. They're praising the Lord. You can hear them in the villages. They're worshiping. They've got the services going again, and <clears throat> they have a new vision, a new mission when Nehemiah, the leader, heads back to Persia, 
the folks begin to coast, they begin to drift, and then they find themselves back in their old habits. They stop seeking God, and they start seeking after power, prosperity, and pleasure. I'm going to show you how that goes. We're going to look down in verse 13 and just see how this digression happens. First of all, <clears throat> first of all they begin seeking after power. Look in uh, verse 4. Eliashib, the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah. I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah and preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God, and it grieved me bitterly. If you remember, Tobiah was the Ammonite government official who became angry at Nehemiah and started slandering him and criticizing him and condemning him and ridiculing him. Tobiah was one of the ones that was saying, you're rebelling against the king. If a fox jumps on this wall, he'll knock it down. This is, this is horrible. And, and, and here, Eliashib, the high priest, one of Nehemiah's top leaders, gives him an office adjacent to the temple where they're supposed to be gathering the grain and the, and, and the, and the, tre and the treasury house. He's got an office there at the temple. Do you notice something? Nehemiah did not react kindly nor graciously toward this breach of trust from one of his top leaders. Look down in verse number uh, four there and, and nine. I'm kind of skipping around. Therefore, Nehemiah talking, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. I commanded them to cleanse the rooms and I brought back into the articles of the house of God with, uh, I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with grain offerings and frankincense. <coughs> Nehemiah um, was disappointed with Eliashib. Eliashib was the high priest. And, and, the, and the, uh, the unfortunate thing here is that he didn't see his high position there with humility and honor and respect and privilege of this leadership appointment that he had, this position that he had, he wanted more. He, he ended up with a power loss. He wanted the power of alliance with Nehemiah's enemy. And, and, and this corrupt politician, he's allowing him on the temple grounds to defile the temple by having an office in one of the sacred rooms of the temple. So he said, why would he do that? The lust for power. That's it. Allying with someone else, trying to get power, no matter what the cost. And, uh, and there you go. Not only that, they begin seeking after prosperity. They sought power. Now they're going to seek pro prosperity. Look at verse 10. I also realized that the, position, that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for each of the Levites and the singers did the work, uh, that did the work, had gone back to his field to work, obviously. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Now, some of the leaders, the rulers, and the people they started coasting, they started drifting, and they stopped supporting the ministry. But what's worse is they begin neglecting the Sabbath. They begin working instead of worshiping on the Lord's day. Look down in verse number 15. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, figs, grapes, all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. If you remember, one of the things they did is they set aside the Sabbath day in order to worship on those days. And, and according, if, if you go back to 2 Chronicles 36, according to that passage of Scripture, the very reason 
that the Israelites went into 70 years of captivity into Babylon is because they neglected the Sabbath year. They said, we, 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 we need to make money. I mean, that's the top thing. We need to make money, so we're not going to take the year off. We're not going to take the Sabbath off. And they ended up in captivity for 70 years. Again, Nehemiah had to address this issue. Look at verse 17. So I contended with the nobles. What was happening is the leaders, the nobles were leading them. So, man, we've got to make more money. And, and they're violating this principle. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what evil thing is this that you've done by which you profane the Sabbath day? And then he reminds them of the captivity. Did not your fathers do this? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. What they're doing is they decide, you know, working, making money, doing all this is so much important than serving the Lord and worshiping. So the leaders and people quit supporting the ministry. They were seeking prosperity by working rather than worshiping. They made the choice. So they did that. They, they began seeking power. They began seeking after prosperity. And then they started seeking after pleasure. Look down at verse 23. In those days, I also saw Jews who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Now, what some of you might be thinking is so. What, what, what's the deal here? Well, you've got to go back into the history of Israel to see. You see, Ashdod was where Samson went to find prostitutes. And he was a leader, by the way. Ammon was where babies were being sacrificed to Molech. That was the seat of human sacrifice. And Moab was where the seductive little teenage women would seduce Jewish men during the Exodus when, when they tried to bring the children of Israel through Moab and Balaam stood on the mountain to try to curse them and ended up blessing them. And Balaam said, don't worry about that. Just get your seductive women to seduce the men of Israel and God will destroy them for it. And, and the plague broke out and, and, it, and it nearly ruined them. And then he does a commentary on that. He, he's, he, he uh, looked down at verse 26. Nehemiah does a commentary. So did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations, there was no king like him who was beloved of God and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, Pagan women cause even him to sin. <clears throat> this right here is where Nehemiah lost it. <laughs> I mean, he comes back. He's got them set up. They're worshiping. They're in revival. I'll be gone for a year, maybe a year, maybe a little. He goes to Persia. He comes back, and everything is falling apart. They're seeking after power. They're seeking after prosperity. Now they're seeking after pleasure through moral depravity. And let me read this passage of Scripture to you in verse number 25. 25, he says, so I contended with them. I cursed them. I struck some of them. I pulled out their hair. I made them swear by God, saying, you shall not give your daughters and wives to their sons or take their daughters uh, to your sons for yourselves. I think the man lost it right there, don't you? <laughs> you ever feel like that? I feel like that sometimes. Here's the thing. With Nehemiah's leadership, they sought God. They were in revival. He led them. He was consistent. He prayed. They experienced revival. And when he was out of leadership, they experienced revival relapse because they stopped seeking God. They started seeking the blessing instead of the blesser. They started seeking power, prosperity, and pleasure sinfully. You know, Israel went through that multiple times. I think our country's going back through that. It looks like about the fifth time we've gone through that. What a tragic ending to the book of Nehemiah. It ends there. And so my question to you today is, I find us here in America, 
kind of in the same shape. We're in a revival relapse. And so the question is, how do we snap out of it? How do we get back into revival? How can we as leaders and as a church do anything to change this trajectory? Well, Nehemiah doesn't quite finish the book there. He goes on and he demonstrates three ways that we can turn the tide. And I want to cover those three ways very quickly that we've done. Number one, we must separate ourselves from divisive people. Look at verse 28. One of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Elishabib, the high priest, was son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. There I drove him from me. Now, he's already said that he, that, that he gave Tobiah an office, and now he's, his, son, uh, his daughter has married into Sanballat's line. You say, now, remind me who Sanballat is. Sanballat is mentioned 10 times in the book of Nehemiah. Every time he's mentioned, he is angry, slanderous, jealous, divisive, and conspiratory. And here what he has done is he has weaseled his way into the high priest's family and brought this divisive cancer into the family. I can imagine talk at the dinner table after the Sabbath services around that table. Tobiah, uh, Sanballat, son-in-law, and uh, having Nehemiah for dinner. Look at verse 29. Nehemiah's praying, remember them, O God, because they defiled the priesthood. I, I don't know if you understand how serious this is, but back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9 through 10, Paul refers to people like Sanballat and Tobiah and his son-in-laws as revilers who slander church elders, church leaders, and proclaim uh, that, uh, that, there is a, that there is a penalty for this kind of reviling, this kind of slandering. And here's what it says, and I quote, if you go back and check me out on this, they, the, these type people, are you ready for this? Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty tough, right? You say, does that mean they're going to hell? No, it doesn't mean they're not going to hell. It means they're going to lose out in God's kingdom. They're going to suffer loss. They're going to suffer rewards if they're saved. If they're not saved, they won't go to heaven. But if they are saved, uh, this is what happens. Nehemiah, so what does, he do? what does he do? He separates himself from these revilers. And so must we. When someone comes around complaining, slandering, criticizing church leaders and church elders, it is time to say, excuse me, I need to go see a man about a horse. <laughs> you know, what does that have to do? It's the signal. Stop criticizing. I'm not going to listen anymore. I'm out of here. So we must separate ourselves from divisive the people. The second thing we must do is we must sanctify ourselves from destructive practices. Uh, look at verse 30, the first part. He says, then I cleansed them of everything pagan. Most commentators struggle to understand just exactly what Nehemiah meant by everything pagan. The Hebrew word for pagan here is the car. And it simply means foreign. So you go back and say, well, what foreign things did they have in their culture and their community at that time? And when you go back, you find out that there's Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Well, what, what about that? It's the practices that these people were bringing into the children of Israel. Moral depravity, human trafficking, infant sacrifice. And, and they were, it was commonplace in their culture, folks, like it is commonplace in the American culture today. Abortion is commonplace. We hear about human trafficking, moral depravity, 
the industry. We'll talk about that in a moment. The Jewish people were allowing depraved people, depraved promoters, and products from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab to come into their country, corrupt their minds, and defile their people. I want to give you some disturbing stats as I begin, as I'm studying this week, just looking through where we're at in America today. A recent survey reports that 70% of, and I think this is a focus on the family survey, 70% of Christian men dabble in pornography. 70% of Christian men dabble in pornography. 30% of Christians say that they use prescriptive sim stimulants, narcotics, psychedelics, and hallucinogenics recreationally. And 45% of Christian youth report that they've become sexually active by the age of 18. Folks, we're in trouble. If we intend to see revival, we must first have removal of some of the pagan things that we have in our culture right now. We've got to go through a time of personal repentance. We as believers do. Over in Second Chronicles, God doesn't say, if those people will turn to their wicked ways, he says, if my people, of course he's talking about Israel, but we can, we can apply it to ourselves here. So if we intend to have revival, we must have repentance, we must have removal, we must sanctify ourselves from destructive practices, products, people. Repentance always precedes revival. When people drop down on their knees, they begin to pray, and they begin to unify, then the Holy Spirit begins to move. So we've got to separate ourselves from divisive people. We've got to sanctify ourselves from destructive practices. And then the third thing is we must surrender ourselves to dedicated purposes. Look at verse 30, the last part of it there. Nehemiah, I also assigned duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits <coughs> at appointed times. And then he prays again, remember me, O God, for good. He, immediately following the reforms, Nehemiah gets his priests, his Levites, his leaders, and his people together, and he reorients them with purpose. God didn't make you to go after these things that you're going after. He, he, he made you for, for his purposes. So, uh, so he refocuses them on service of the ministry. So they, they go back to... They, they, he reorients them, gets them going back to sacrifice, service, and worship. Here's the thing. God has wired us for, with spiritual gifts, personality traits, passion for ministry, and purposes. He's created us in Christ Jesus toward good works, as we're studying in Project 210. We are purpose-oriented. God wants us to join him and his purpose of reviving and restoring our nation. God wants to restore our nation, and he's looking to us to join him, and we can't join a holy God if we're unholy. So as we separate ourselves from divisive people, sanctify ourselves from destructive practices, surrender ourselves to a dedicated purpose, we are ready to experience a God-sent, holy, I like the way they used to say it, Holy Ghost revival that will get us back on track, save our nation from the destructive path that we're on now. And folks, you are on a destructive path. Earlier this week, Dave, Betty, and I, and a small number of pastors and leaders in the community, um, we went to the screening of the documentary. You're going to probably hear about this more uh, in the coming months. This is coming out next month. It's called the 1916 Project. Uh, it's sort of a pushback uh, against the 1619 Project. 1916, 1619. You say, well, remind me about the 1619 Project. 
This was launched by the New York Times on August the 19th, the 1619 Project, 2019, with the idea of rewriting American history to, make, to basically make American Christians look evil. That was what it's, that, that's what it is to reorient uh, our history. This documentary, the 1916 Project, traces our current crisis that we're in right now to the abortion industry of, uh, and, and human trafficking and multi-million dollar child pornography and exploitation ministry, traces it all back to 1916 and Margaret Sanger and the beginning of Planned Parenthood in 1916. So let me share. So I, I, I went back. I heard a lot of stuff. I went back and did some research. And just the research that I've done is a wake-up call to me. And on this memorial, uh, the, on this uh, Labor Day weekend, I want it to be a wake-up call to us as I give you these stats. <coughs> Excuse me. Today, Planned Parenthood, which basically does abortions, Planned Parenthood receives $600 million a year from our tax revenues to the government every year, $600 million. The Right to Life organization reports today, as of today, that over 63 million abortions have been, have been performed in the United States since R.V. Wade back in 1973. And this is what's startling since the overturn of R.V. Wade back in <clears throat> 22, 19, uh, 2022, there's been a spike in abortions. They've gone up, not down. And we've seen over a million abortions since the overturn of R.V. Wade. Number three, the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, reports, and you can find this, you, I mean, you've got you to really search down to find this, but it's the Department of Homeland Security reports that nearly 300,000 migrant children have gone missing over the last three years during this border crisis that we're having. They come in the United States, they disappear. They're sold into human trafficking. According to the FBI, this will shake you up. According to the FBI, 460,000 children are reported missing every year in the United States. That's over 1,000 a day. According to LinkedIn, the child pornography industry nets approximately 13 billion dollars as best they can tell some some think it goes as high as 90 billion dollars but they can document about 13 billion in revenue in the United States with over 100,000 internet websites producing this material here, here, here here's the one Houston, Texas is the number one city in the United States for human trafficking of children. I, I want I to double check the information from this project that we were looking at to make sure that, that it was accurate. And I was stunned. I knew it was bad. I was stunned. Uh, we, we, there was a panel discussion, and one of the guys uh, on the uh, in the panel, his his little sister had been kidnapped, been abducted at 13 years old, and he he just stopped his life and went to find her, found her. Six years later, after being trafficked, had m multiple abortions, so that she could keep working. And one of the stats that I found in my research is that three or four girls that are trafficking can bring in as many as much as $460,000 a year. It's amazing. This 
man who's from South Africa turned to the audience and he said something that was convicting. He looked out there and he said, guys, the stats are, and I just want to check this out, are that 70% of Christian men are dabbling in pornography. So if you're dabbling in pornography, he said, it's time for repentance because we're not going to vote ourselves out of this crisis. We're going to, we, we've, we've got to have revival, and revival comes from removal of, of pagan things in our lives and repentance. That's where it starts for us. This is a call to action. If we intend to reverse this revival relapse that we're in, we will have to follow this prescription. We, we have to separate, sanctify, surrender. Let me say it again. Separate, sanctify, surrender. Separate from divisive people. Sanctify from pagan practices. Surrender to dedicated service. Last week I announced, and we and you see some stuff on the door and some, some sign-up sheets out there, a ministry rally that we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks on the 15th. This is, this is, I want to start out on a light note. It's going to be a little bit of fun, but it's serious as, as, as a heart attack. Because what, here, here's the thing at this rally. This rally is a volunteer appreciation dinner, and it's more, and it's complimentary. You don't have to pay. Good barbecue, you know. But it's more than that. It's a call to action. We're, we're going to go over some strategies. This is a spiritual war that we are in, whether you realize it or not. And we are, uh, we're, we're predators are targeting our children. While politicians and news agencies and pulpits across America are ignoring what's going on. Somebody's got to wake up or we're going to find ourselves as a country no more. So I want to challenge every one of you to join me in the spiritual war. Let's reverse the trend. Sign up. Come to the banquet. Get involved in the strategy. See what we're going to do. Work with us. And I believe that if we will follow this prescription here, God can ignite a revival right here at community, in our community, that is spread in our country. But we're going to have to follow the prescription. I want to challenge you to join me in that spiritual war and reverse this trend. God is so patient with us. He sees us through these cycles, and he's open-armed for us to say, you're right, Lord, and turning back to him. This is the call to action. On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community. Thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others and please know you are always welcome to be our guest during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link www.cbcwoodlands.org. I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.